the floor! I told you you didn't be on a damn thing out there! I want you to be perfect! When I'm driving, I got a guy on the radio who talks to me. I can't see him, but he talks to me. He didn't slam you, he didn't bump you, he didn't nudge you, he rubbed you. And rubbing son is racing. Hey race fans, welcome to the Hoobazoo Radio Network and welcome to Drafting the Circuits. My name is Frank Santoroski, I'll be your host for the next hour as we talk about this past week in racing and preview next week and the weeks to come. Joining me in the studio tonight, I've got Richard Uden, Seth Eggert, Luis Torres. Fellas, how we doing? Doing good, thank good. you. I'm actually right. pretty flattered. Pretty flattered, okay. huh? <laughs> Great to talk to you guys. Uh, we had um, this past weekend, we had a um, 70th anniversary Grand Prix in um, Silverstone. We had a doubleheader in Michigan. And just earlier today, as we're taping, uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway opened up for practice. But uh, let's lead off with Silverstone because Richard, yep. the guy we're used to winning, didn't win. I know. Uh, and again, we had some. <laughs> <laughs> we again, we had uh, some issues with the tires. So, uh, man, take us through Silverstone because I thought it was a pretty entertaining show. Well, indeed, and in the 70th anniversary race, it's the um, the first race in Formula One history, uh, sort of 1,024 races or whatever it is, not to be named after a geographic location. So there's uh, there's one for your for your for your, uh, for your trivia night. Um, yep. Yeah. Fantastic of a race again. You know, it's always always good sources. And the, the changes they made to the layout there about ten years or so ago are, are really, you know, producing some really good racing. And uh, we saw, uh, although it was the second week in a row the race there, there was a change of tire compound. So on the scale of five tires, um, the previous week they'd used the three hardest compounds. Uh, this week they're at the sort of middle three, so they were one step softer. And it caused them all sorts of troubles. Uh, you know, it was even hotter than it had been the previous week. Uh, Pirelli had uh, made some legality changes to the pressures that were allowed. And it just didn't suit the Mercedes. You know, the, the Mercedes has always seen a very small operating window uh, in terms of tyre temperatures. You know, when it gets too hot, the track temperature gets too hot and the tyres are too soft. The Mercedes just blisters and grains the tyres far, far, far too much. And... They can normally get away with it because their pace is so good that they can back off and control the race, the tire wear. But um, you, know, with the with the tire lives being so much shorter than the previous week, they didn't have that opportunity. And uh, Max Verstappen and the Red Bull took advantage of that. And uh, yeah, they they lost the race. You know, as we talked about, you know, there's no doubt that Mercedes is still the fastest car. But at the end of the race, at the end of the day, you've got to get, you know all 52 laps or whatever it is, um, you know, under your belt. And they didn't do that. And the Red Bulls covered them pretty comfortably there in the end. Um, so you had Max Verstappen win uh, with, with Lewis coming second after a late pit stop. Uh, after he tried, I think he tried to stretch to a one-stop strategy, which Charles Leclerc managed to do quite comfortably, actually, in the end. But it was never really an option for Mercedes. And then you had Valtteri Bottas come in third, who'd got a great pole, um, on the Saturday, took the the lead at the start of the race, and for the first stint um, on the on the softer tyre, Valtteri had uh, Lewis's number really, and then they stopped at the first stop. They stopped lap after lap and came out in order. Verstappen kept going on the um, slightly harder tyre that he was he was on there, and he controlled his pace really really well. And then I think Bottas really got uh, quite badly done over by the Mercedes team there. Um, they're trying to defend it, but I think he was a little bit unlucky. So uh, with about 20 laps to go, um, Bottas pitted with tyres that were, were heavily worn and blistered. And the plan was for Hamilton to stop the very next lap, which they'd done at the first round of stops, which is conventional team you know, strategy for a team like Mercedes. 
But after taking Bottas's tyres off, the team looked at them and said, well, these are just blistering. They're not graining, they're not delaminating, they're not failing. So, Lewis, if you can drive through the blistering, well, you've probably got another 10 laps on the tyres. And in all three, that's what he did. And it, it shuffled Valtteri you know, back because uh, Hamilton could come in and stop later. So then when he came back out, he only had eight or ten laps on at the end of the race so he could push and was able to get past Bottas. So undoubtedly Bottas wasn't happy about that. Um, but I, I I totally understand why. I think that he was um, harshly done by, should we say, there a little bit. Um, I, I think what would have been fair is that if they, the team had turned around to Hamilton and said, OK, we've we've learned on the strategy here. You have a go at max. You go out on those last ten laps, eight laps, whatever it is, and really push. If you can get past Hamilton, fantastic. If not, you let Valtteri back through. Because Valtteri was quicker than Hamilton all weekend. So, Yeah, I mean, but at, at the same time, you know, Hamilton has a pretty commanding lead in the championship. Valtteri has dropped back, uh, you know, over the last couple of weeks, you know, particularly after yep. the uh, dropping out of the points uh, a few races back. Yep, yeah, um, yeah. So, I mean, they're still trying to defend the championship. But, I mean, from, from Red Bull, I don't know. I mean, you, you want to you imagine that they, they throw their own guy a bone. Here and there, yeah. you know, and, and exactly, and, you know, Bottas has just signed a contract extension, you know, one year contract extension, which is just basically a duplicate of this year's contract with the dates changed. And then you go and put it bluntly, you kick the guy in the balls at the first opportunity, you know, it's like, wow, um, you know, probably not what Valtteri wanted uh, in the grand scheme of things. And I felt, I, I did feel sorry for him because you've got to, you know, you, you strategy was what got Hamilton ahead there, not pace. You know, Valtteri was faster all weekend. Um, and, and, you know, he deserved, you know, if you look at it, he won qualifying, for want of a better word, and he won the start, and he won, you know, the first stint. So, yeah, I think you've got to give him a, bit, a little bit of credit. Yeah, it, it would have been nice for him to have that outing, to give that title chase a little bit more closer, but to... I mean, it was, it would have, I think even if he'd done it, even if he had finished ahead of Hamilton, it, he'd still be more than one race win behind, yeah. I think, on the points. So, so I mean... It, I'm not saying this is as bad as when Barrichello let Schumacher through after like eight races no. or whatever it was back in the day, but it still was a little bit. I felt really sorry for him there, and um, it was you know, rather he, he was he was unhappy. Yeah, it was a rather frustrating yeah. race for those guys. You could visibly tell Toto was none too pleased about the overall performance because they kind of let let that one slip away from them. That to where Max got that win by a lot yeah. of circumstances. No, they did, and, and for the last three or four years, the one Achilles heel of Mercedes have, has been the hot race. And typically when we go to hot races, you're thinking Singapore, somewhere like that, when we used to go to Malaysia and Bahrain and places like that, they're not necessarily high-speed tracks. So you can run relatively high downforce levels, and that will also allow you to open up the cooling package, and it'll be less of an issue when you increase the drag through the cooling. But... Silverstone is a high-speed track, and they had a compromise. They're like, okay, well, do we increase our cooling by opening up some of the rear du- rear bodywork and some of the brake ducts and, and the like, um, or do we, um, you know, sacrifice, uh, you know, the the tire performance? So it was interesting. It was it's an interesting gamble, and and at the end of the day, who would imagine that Silverstone would be one of the hottest races of the year, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, so, Silverstone is usually about, it's about a month earlier, right, or a month and a half earlier? Typically early July, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah so um, we're, when, the, when the temperatures aren't quite as hot as in the dog days yeah, of August. No, no. I mean, the thing with Silverstone is it's its own microcosm of uh, climate. I mean, I used to live less than 10 miles from the track, and you could hear the, you know, lots of different series every weekend racing out there from my backyard, and um, it could be, you know, glorious 75 at my house and it would be 50 and raining at the track. You know, it, it, for some reason, it has this own little climate, which has always been, you know, a, a challenge and windy as well. So it's very rich in the former air base uh, for the Second World War. So it's, it's very open, very ex- It's normally the biggest issue. So quick question, Richard, you talked about yeah. being near Silverstone. Were you able to hear you? You know about the race that they have like 200 cars of the same, like 200 identical cars, right? Yes. 
Were you yeah, able yeah. to hear those cars when they ran? Oh, you could hear everything. I mean, especially oh. if the wind was in the right direction, because it was a big open flat area, and you could hear everything that came from there. I mean, when you had, you know, when they had the world superbikes there, you could they were really high pitched squeal from those things. Um, you used to have an event called the Brick Car 24, which was an endurance race, which was saloon style racing, but the old British touring car style events. Um, you know, the British touring cars again they'd go there two or three times a year and those were fun events to go to and British Formula 3 was another fun event and you could go for the whole day for like a, so you'd normally have like the British touring cars and Formula 3 and Formula Renault and Formula VW Golfs or whatever it were you know so you could literally you get there at 8am and leave at 7pm and you'd have you know almost 12 hours of solid racing it would cost you like $25 to get in and all the grandstands were open. It was fantastic. That's how racing should be. So yeah, um, well, certainly got it all worth your bargain for sure. Twenty-five dollars, get all that all day. That sounds like an absolute win. I just wanted oh, to know so that. Yeah, I just wanted to know that from your perspective if those cars were audible because I know as one of those PB doesn't do it justice type stuff. No, they don't. And 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 the problem is, you know, everybody watches you know, NASCAR, Formula One, IndyCar, or whatever it is on TV, and you know, that's what everybody thinks race cars sound like. But you just go down a level or two, and these are still incredible performance machines, you know, that are on the edge and sound amazing, and they're so much fun to be around. And, uh, yeah, I used to go there, and I'd end up taking, like, you know, 1,500 photos or something while I was down there and fill up memory cards, and, oh, yeah, so much fun, so much fun out there. Yeah, I had that. <laughs> I probably ran out all my cards in one day for sure. <laughs> yes, and my two cameras. <laughs> yeah. So that. let's uh, let's get back to the race for a second, and, yeah. and let's talk about Hamilton. Okay, Hamilton yep. tends to be pretty bulletproof when things go his way. Yes. Um, he uh, he got a little animated on the radio. Um, certainly talking about how Max probably had, uh, what do you say, less tire oh, pressure? tire pressures. Less, yeah, less tire yeah, pressure yeah. and whatnot. And then he had, yeah. you know, Valtteri beat him in qualifying. Um, but we, we've not seen these, you know, chinks in the armor of Hamilton, <laughs> oh, since the, um, you know, Nico Rosberg days when uh, Nico was able to, yeah. uh, uh, so uh, do you, do you feel like this maybe could be a, a turning point in this season to kind of open up this championship? A bit. No. I, I know it's. I know Lewis has a has a you know no. really strong hold on it at this at this moment. But uh, uh, these sort of things tend to affect him more than than other drivers. At times it does. I, I think the issue you saw with Rosberg was amplified by their history. You know, these guys were great friends growing up go karting. They'd driven you know driven karts together since they were eight years old or whatever it was, and they'd. They used to, you know, live at each other's house during the summers and, you know, whenever they were traveling together, they'd always share a hotel or whatever. And they were very, very close. And then, you know, when they finally became teammates in Formula 1, everybody envisaged that it was this, you know, match made in heaven sort of thing. These two great buddies, you know, racing against each other. And, you know, Rosberg played the game and, you know, Rosberg got under his skin. I, I don't think Valtteri will because they don't have that added dimension to the relationship. And I'm not for one minute saying that Rosberg was a better driver than Hamilton because I think Hamilton's proven that he was the, the ultimate driver in many, many ways. Um, but I think that I just don't see that dynamic, that personal dynamic, which and, – and, and the Hamilton is a very – emotional guy on a personal level and i think he i i think he's he's mature enough now that he's not going to let that encroach on this battle here okay yeah no i i tend to agree with you there yes i but i just want to throw that out there because uh, yes no, yeah I mean, I mean you know a lot was made in the press of his uh is being so animated on the radio, so so we're off to no, Spain. I mean, it's, we're off it's to just sp- writing. Yeah, it's just writing. Well, yeah, you got yeah, you got to get your headlines and your post clicks. Of course you do. Yeah, so so we're off to Spain next. Yeah. Um, are we doing doing one race in Spain or two? One race. Yep, one race. And if it rains in Spain, it's mainly on the plane. So indeed, it will be. But <laughs> and, Catalonia's in the mountains, so uh, yeah, Catalonia's in the mountains, so. So do you, so do you feel like this is another track that's just going to be another um, 
uh, you know, Mercedes dominant win, or is this a sort of track yeah. that may favor uh, the Red Bulls? Uh, of course, Ferrari has yeah. kind of written themselves out of the equation this year, but uh, you know, more on that. To I mean, come. it all depends on it all depends on temperature. I think if it's hot, which it's supposed to be, uh, then there's a potential that you could see uh, Red Bull mix it up there. But you'd also like to think that maybe Mercedes will be a little bit better prepared. Uh, than they were last week. You know, the one thing you can say about Mercedes is when they find a weakness or an error or somewhere where they can improve, they are very reactionary and they do react pretty quickly to it and they do rectify those issues. So even if it is as hot as it was at Silverstone, I still wouldn't expect them to struggle in the same way that they did. They'll be able to manage the situation far better, I feel. All right. So uh, speaking of Ferrari, so what's going on over there? <laughs> you know, well, it just I mean, seems like I mean, so yeah, they I had so it. there's yeah. a new Vettel's picking up a new chassis now because they, they figured yeah. out that one was damaged. Yeah, um, I mean, there's, it was apparently damaged going over the curbs, and the, the strength of these chassis and these tubs is such that going over the curbs is not going to cause such major damage. It's you, you're basically seeing a scenario in a situation here now where Ferrari are pushing Vettel out. They're mm-hmm. You know, they're keeping him at an arm's length because, you know, wherever he goes, he'll probably go to a reasonably competent drive and they will see him as a rival. And obviously there's a lot of information that Vettel doesn't want or they don't want Vettel to to have access to. So there's partly that. There's partly, and you've seen this with Seb in the past. If you look back to when Daniel Ricciardo came at Red Bull, you know, the, the season they were together there when Ricciardo beat Vettel. You know, Vettel just... just I don't know. There's something about he just doesn't do well when the teammate, when whoever he's driving against, is better than him. He really struggles. Um, or not better than him, but maybe gets under his skin a little bit, as, as Danny did and, and Charles is obviously doing again this time. Um, obviously, if the Ferrari was more competitive, you would um, imagine that Seb would probably close that gap up a little bit. But uh, and, and we could do a whole show on Ferrari's technical shortcomings with their engine that they've seen com- in comparison to last season. So there's a lot going on there, obviously. Um, and it's just, you know, they, they, they've they dropped the ball a little bit um, and they're, they're certainly down on performance compared to where they were last year. And it, it's just being amplified. Um, I imagine that, you know, they'll get better throughout the season making incremental changes, but you can pretty much write off this season and next, because next season, with all the restrictions uh, due to COVID, um, they can't develop the car for next year. So basically what they have this year is what they're going to have next year as well. So it's probably going to be two years before you see Ferrari in a strong position to, to challenge for the lead. So, the championship. so we should expect like the 94, 95, or even 92, yeah. 93 Ferrari time period, yeah. Yeah. where like a Ford place... Yeah, where like a fourth place finish for, by Leclerc is a win by their standards at this point oh, this yeah. year. Yeah. Which and you and and, and 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 you know Formula One probably more so than any of the Formula Motorsport. You have to cut your cloth, cloth accordingly. You know, you know where you are in the hierarchy, and you're over the course of a season. If you have the fifth fastest car, you will finish fourth, fifth, or sixth in the championship. If you have the seventh fastest car, you'll probably finish sixth, seventh, eighth. You know, you're not going to deviate much. You know, strategy can only get you so far. Development can only get you so far. You know, you're pretty much where you are, where you are. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think Ferrari are probably fourth best car right now, maybe fifth. Uh, you know, I was say maybe fifth, yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably you know, right you, Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you'll probably see a little sort of migration of performance between the likes of Racing Point, Renault, McLaren, and Ferrari. That Those four are sort of vying for third, if you like, at best. Which is definitely true, and also it's just the matter of Racing Point fighting consistency on race day, because the both the two races that, Hulk, that the Hawks have got to run, race day has been the polar opposite, to say the least, which is unfortunate, because yeah. everybody was thinking Hulkenberg is finally qualifying third, it's going to be finally the day he's going to get that podium, but yeah. non-factor. No, I mean they they, they they probably I think you know Max even admitted he would made a mistake in qualifying, so he probably should have been third on the grid. And you know Hulkenberg hasn't driven a race in nine months or so, so 
from a fatigue standpoint, that's going to take an effect on him. He hadn't done a race start. There's lots of things he hadn't done. He hadn't done a pit stop. And in all fairness, and I obviously I cannot quantify this, but they racing point put him on a three stop strategy. And I, if you're putting your um, cynical hat on, that was to get Lance Stroll more points. Yeah. Yeah, uh, because, yeah. you know, I mean, Hulkenberg, oh, but now, now, Hulkenberg, Hulkenberg for... humiliated Stroll this weekend. You know, yeah, no, yeah, gonna, that's... it's a harsh word, but, you know, he was like every practice session, he was like half a second faster yeah. than Lance Stroll. And in all fairness, you know, if, if you're one of the team owners there, and obviously, you know, we don't know what's happening with Vettel, but you're thinking, well, hang on, is Perez any better than Hulkenberg? You know, if you have to keep Stroll because of the family connections, you know, you look at Hulkenberg and think, well, okay, first race, meh, whatever. But second race... He didn't would... even get the run of first race because he didn't even no. start No, no. But, you know, practice and qualifying is a little bit off. But then he had a week to work with the team and get to understand, you know. Would Perez have off a second faster in every than Stroll? Probably not. I mean, there is... Obviously, Perez is a faster driver than Stroll. You know, I don't think there's any question about it. But half a second to three quarters of a second in every session, that was a big gap. And Yeah, so you gotta, you got to of... wonder if, if maybe... Perez is in a little bit of trouble with his seat for the rest of the year. I don't know how ironclad his contract is, but but you put yeah. another guy in the car who's been sitting, on, you know, sitting idle most that, of the year and and hops yeah. in there and yeah. So on top of that, is he even cleared to run uh, in Spain yet? Uh, I that's believe another question. so. Well, he's got to obviously pass the yeah, he's got tests to pass and everything. Earth. And, and I, I know he I did before the second British Grand Prix. I don't know if he will. Uh, if I mean, imagine, hopefully he you know, does. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that it's created, and it's certainly highlighted to a lot of team bosses that you know Hulkenberg is somebody to consider. You know, if you're a Alfa Romeo or a Haas or you, well, probably not Williams because I think they're pretty settled with Latifi and Russell, aren't they? But you know, if you're one of those other, you know, teams who are looking for a driver still for next year, even a Toro Ross or Alfa or whatever they're called now, you know, would a Hulkenberg be a terrible pick? Even Red Bull, you know, for that main team yeah. to go up against Verstappen. Because yeah, I hate to say You need a solid this. number two driver to if, fight for the constructors with Mercedes. Exactly. If Red Bull are going to go toe-to-toe with Mercedes and, you know, Ferraris and, and McLarens and Renault, toe-to-toe, towards the end, you know, it's for a champ- constructors championship, which at the end of the day is what the teams care about, probably more than the drivers' oh. championships. I know Red Bull give a bonus for constructors' championship. I don't think they give a bonus for drivers' championship anymore. But, uh, and I hate to say this, I think Alex Albon is a, a talented driver. But is, are his performances any better than Gasly's? Well, what uh, I was going uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's making mistakes in practice. He's Losing track time, and he keeps putting himself behind the eight ball on a regular, regular basis. And what I was going to say just now is, uh, Hulkenberg, he would have finished fifth if it wasn't for a, a tire vibration that they called him in for. Uh, yeah. That's what put him behind yeah. Albon and Stroll. Uh, but uh, he had. I mean, a Albon drove five. pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Albon drove, and certainly, I, do, I think he deserves his spot in the grid. But um, you know. I, I think Red Bull have a real problem with that second seat, and I think they need to be make a brave decision. I mean, you know, of, of the four drivers in the Red Bull stable, three of them have, uh, you know, or the three that have an opportunity to go up against Verstappen have all been in that seat, and none of them have really checked all the boxes. Well, you know, Kvyat has matured and is a very, very good driver. Gasly is one of those drivers, dare I say, like Perez, who was like a rabbit, you know, a deer in headlights when he was in the big team. But when he's in a lesser team where there's maybe less pressure, I mean, Gasly's driving as good as anybody out there, you know, on, on raw performance, you know, getting the best out of the car. But, you know, he didn't cut it at Red Bull last year. And you could argue the same this year with Albon. I mean, Albon wasn't even digging up any trees at Toro Rosso last year. Really? Well, he did solid. Can... Well, here's my I mean, question. you could you could only imagine how formidable that team would be if they had held on to Danny Ricardo and you had Danny Ricardo and Max Verstappen together. You know, even even though it might be a little toxic here and there, uh, those guys would be right there at the front every week. You know, maybe right behind a Mercedes, but they'd be um, 
uh, you, you know, I, I think their forwards would be better. Big points. Certainly, you know, certainly, certainly yeah. And that's what you need to win championships. And, I, and as, as I say, I really don't want to knock Alex Albon because I think he was thrown in at the deep end. I think really, you unless you're a phenomenal talent, and I'll talk about Verstappen and the club. I think even Verstappen had two years at Toro Rosso, didn't he, before... And it was a year and a half, no, wasn't it? Because he probably a tad less than that, because because he came in for Spain, didn't he? Yeah, Kvyat in sixteen. Yeah, so he had when you know a year Frostburg and a half maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was a year and a half, give or take. An album was thrown in there after six months, basically. You know, he wasn't even expecting to get that Toro Rosso drive because he hadn't done. You know, he hadn't really done anything in any any of the junior formula. He'd been good and competitive, but he hadn't won any championships, I don't think, and wasn't really the the big name. And he just like, well, you're, you know, have you ever drunk Red Bull? Yeah, okay, good, you've got a seat. Yeah, and um, also funding, and also the family background was hot and, and hot under hot water for a period of time too. Yeah, 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 exactly. And that certainly drew attention, especially in the British media. Um, thing. Doesn't deserve it, but I just think that Red Bull really do need to look at, you know, needing two top drivers to go out there and, and challenge on a regular basis for big points, and so, not just scoring points themselves, but also taking points away from their rivals. Because if if you finish fourth and you, your rival finishes sixth, rather than vice versa, you're doubling the point differential. Yeah, for sure. It's it's kind of like Red Bull's formula teams. They're kind of like mishy washy, kind of like what Joe Gibbs is stuff in the NASCAR and Michigan. Yeah, Washington. when it works well and you get guys, I mean, Vettel didn't actually really come through the Red Bulls singing, but, you know, when you get, like, the um, Daniel Ricciardo and the, the Max Verstappen and guys like that come through, it works. But then you get this sort of, I don't know, there's some, but you would also, you look at the guys that have been through there that have, you know, not, you know, not made it long term in, a, in Formula 1 outside of Red Bull. I mean, probably Carlos Sainz is the exception to the rule, but you yeah. look at guys like Elsewhere, Jorik Verne, and Sebastian Boemi, and you know, really even top, board top. Eight didn't last till there. Yeah, and you know, even top, had an okay top first year. Yeah, I mean, these guys are all top, top, top draw race drivers. And again, we could do a whole two-hour show on the Red Bull, you know, system. Um, might, and, might be a good and one the pros for the and cons of it. Yeah, it might be a good one for the off season. I'd imagine. Make your notes, Frank. There you go. Get that one down. All right. Speaking of which, we probably need to move on. Probably yeah, need to yeah. Any, any, anybody care to pick Hamilton to win at Spain? I'm going to pick Bottas. Okay. And Louise? I think I think Bottas could get the job done. I don't think Verstappen could go back to back. All right. And Seth? Uh, I think I'll be the one to pick Hamilton. Okay. I was going to say I was going to pick Hamilton because somehow you always leave me him because I don't think uh, – Le- Leclerc, I don't think Ferrari is ready just yet. So, but uh, let's uh, let's move on to the NASCAR series. All right, we had uh, uh, Xfinity was out there in Road America, uh, which is always an entertaining race, and we we ran in the rain a little bit, which is always fun to watch. And then we had two Cup races at Michigan. So, uh, Seth, let, let's start with the um, uh, the Xfinity cars out there at Road America. It was Austin Cindric taking his fourth win. Yes, it was Austin Cindric uh, holding off AJ Allmendinger, and Cindric. Uh, it basically wasn't a battle. He dominated the race. He led over uh, uh, 19 of the 45 laps at Road America, with it being a four-mile track. It that is a considerable distance. Uh, he had some of the road course ringers uh, contend. Preston Pardis. Uh, you had. Andy Lally, Kaz Grala up front. So you did have an interesting mix, to say the least. It was relatively a clean race, uh, even with the rain. You had the alternative pitting that NASCAR had announced prior to the season for these standalone races, which, if it wasn't for the pandemic, uh, would have been more than just Road America. And they probably would have had more practice going into this. So it was somewhat complicated to understand. Essentially, uh, when you pitted the first time, you could either take tires or fuel under caution. And then you come back around and do what you didn't do the first time. 
and you had to stay on pit road for at least 60 seconds from pit entrance to pit exit, but you also couldn't exceed a certain amount of time each time you pitted. Yeah, that whole thing to me, it just it doesn't sound like uh, the spirit of racing. You know what I mean? And, and, and also, I, I don't know. I don't know why they well, came up with it. And I, and to the well, fans, it's confusing. Explain. Yeah. So uh, go ahead, explain, explain it. The please. reason why they came up with this was a way of cutting down the number of people going to the track. And this is before the pandemic that they came up with this to try to cut costs for the teams especially the smaller Xfinity Series teams, which essentially cut the crews down, I think, to six or seven people total, uh, the spotter, four for the pit crew, the car chief, and the crew chief, which it's less hotel room, less rental car, less flights, etc. So long run, it would have cut down and saved teams a lot of money, and they would have had at least two, if not three, races worth of before going into Road America had it not been for the pandemic. So right. So there, so my question is, okay. So so when you make a stop, you're either you you're either doing fuel or you're doing tires. Yeah, One or the other. Yeah, yes. What's the what's the purpose of the spending sixty full seconds on pit lane? How does that, so that how does that factor into bringing less guys to the track? Because this way you're not flying in the cup pit crews, uh, basically. So it's uh, less professional pit crews. Because, uh, for example, Jordan Anderson at uh, standalone races for the Truck Series uh, was flying in cup pit crews to pit his team, and was basically paying fifty thousand dollars per race for a pit crew. Meanwhile, this will allow him to basically take shop guys to come and pit his truck because they're going to use this as a gateway in a few weeks. And it'll save him probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $40,000. Yeah, but if you ask me, yeah. right, you should just make the rule you can't bring the cup guys in. Okay, you have to use yeah, your then, existing Xfinity crew. Instead of saying, well, you have to but, take you have to be on pit road 60 seconds. So you're you're essentially handicapping these guys, even if they're the, you know, the, the B team, the Xfinity pit crew, uh, if they do a good job with their driver has to do kind of just like, kind of but just, I, I don't just, think you know, the, I chug thought, along the pit road till he, so he spends enough time there. I, I don't think many of the teams have an Xfinity pit crew anymore. I think as Seth was saying, the vast majority of them are cup crews that step down. So, I think the, the 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 real reason, and you saw it in like Formula E when you did the car swaps, it stops them taking unnecessary risks. You know, especially if you've got a you know a, a race engineer who's having to be a tire changer. You know, um, they'd get it after you know they'd get competent at it. But what you don't want them is them to rush it and make a mistake and you know trip and fall into an oncoming car or something along those lines. So if you give them sixty seconds, you can say okay. Take your time, guys. Don't do anything stupid. Make sure we do it properly and don't put yourselves in danger. You start neutralizing the, the competition, if you like. If you like. Yeah, I mean, because it's a level, you know, feel for everybody. Everybody's got a six eight. Yeah. Well, Louise, so Louise can... what are your thoughts on this? I mean, it's been part of the game with these cost cuttings. I know not just with crew members. You also have spotters doing all three series with one given week, and you got you got like – but also for the road courses, it makes it a little more difficult because you're going to have to need multiple spotters. And I, if I recall, some areas they just don't have it, especially with this time period that we're living, even before and after, it makes it so much challenging that you have to pretty much rely on your own. And there were some instances in that race as well where where a cup, certain things could have been more useful and helpful. But at the end of the day, it's just part of the game these days with the cost cuttings. And... The main thing that I do want to point out, uh, the main issue throughout the whole race that people were complaining about was the length of the cautions, especially because with the alternative pitting, that added at least one lap of caution, which at Road America, we know how long that is. Uh, oh, yeah. One... I mean, Road, Road America's got a, a lower lap count to begin with, so. Yeah. Uh, there's one caution 
that took 29 minutes. Uh, and that was because Jesse Little had gotten off into one of the gravel traps. And when they went to pull him out of the gravel trap, the tow hook that's uh, welded to the front of his car snapped. So that he was still stuck in the gravel trap and they had to figure out how to push him out without getting the tow truck stuck. Uh, I'd imagine Jesse was not only mad, it was a bad week for him, period, because I think one of his, one of his close loved ones or something like that lost their life to cancer, which they had that tribute decal. On the other side, I'd imagine... While angry enough what's going on, I imagine he was just, he probably had to absorb the wall where Graham Ray Hall cracked it that a couple about a month ago as well to see if it's fixed. I don't know. Try that. Bad I, joke, I know. Yeah, that was pretty yeah, he's like, let me make sure that fix this. Well I was gonna say the only major incident in that race was uh Justin Allgaier tried to clear himself because again, as Louise was alluding to some teams don't bring as many spallers. There are some drivers that only prefer one or two spallers in general at a track like Road America or Indianapolis Motor Speedway or other tracks. So Allgaier only had the one, and he tried to clear himself, spun off the nose of Kaz Grala, slammed the uh, wall off turn three, collected Jeffrey Earnhardt, Myatt Snyder, Jeremy Clements. Uh, it was a pretty hard crash. Uh, f- at first, it looked like Allgaier didn't have a lot of damage. Then when he turned around, uh, the whole driver's side was practically missing. So that was one of the harder crashes I've seen at Road America, at least for the Xfinity Series, in a long time. Yeah. So let's let's get back to talking about the winner. So Tim Sindrick, or I'm sorry, Austin Sindrick, rather. <laughs> uh, this is his uh, this is fourth win on the season, right? So he's really he's really kind of uh, staying acclaim as one of the championship favorites. Um, you know, are as you going to say it, my Frank? This is Indy 500 right around the corner yeah. for him. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Well, what's that? And, he doesn't have and, a contract so, next year. He does not have a contract for next year in NASCAR as of right now. Sorry. Well, I, I can't mean, help it. I can't help it. Brandy, as soon as he said that, rumors started popping up of him supposedly going to the Wood Brothers 21 or him supposedly going to this car or supposedly going to that car. Only him and uh, Team Penske know what's actually going on. Uh, so I know I've said in the past I think he needs another year in Xfinity. Whether or not that ends up being the case by the end of the year, if I still think the same, I'm not sure. But looking at the current landscape in the Cup Series and who is where, unless Team Penske either adds a fourth car, which I don't think they're going to do, or... uh has another alliance with somebody. I don't see Cindric going up to Cup. Who knows? He may not even go up to Cup with Penske or in a Penske line car. There's other places he could end up going uh, because he's even said that it's always been assumed that because his father works for Penske that he'll be in a Penske car. That's not necessarily the case for him, though. I, if I remember correctly, well, yeah, I mean, we and we've seen that sort of thing in the past. I, yeah, like currently, Graham Rahal drives for his daddy, but his all of Graham's early rides in IndyCar were with uh, he was with Newman Haas, mm-hmm. and he was with um, uh, Roosevelt, I think, for a year. Uh, so he, he he ended up back home, but he, he you know he kind of sowed his wild oats elsewhere. Uh, which and, and there's no reason that if a uh, you know say like a top performing Toyota team or even a, a Chevy team had an open spot and they they want to take a look at Austin Cedric, I, I don't I don't see that uh, the fact that his uh, you know his his pops is the president of Pesky Racing is going to keep him from that if it's a good opportunity. And, and again, like Seth, you said we think he needs another year in, in, in uh, Xfinity. I said that about nine weeks ago myself. He's kind of proven us wrong. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah I, you I know what I mean? He, the the, the kid's pretty weeks, darn good. Yeah. yeah, I said that about three or four weeks ago, and at that time I think he only had the two wins. He's since doubled that. Uh, 
Right, and, right, yeah, so. And there's several rides that might end up being open in one way or another, whether it's uh, the Ganassi 42, uh, Petty's 43, uh, something possibly at JTG Doherty, if you listen to uh, uh, the talk around the garage, essentially. But uh, point is, like I said, and like you were saying about Graham Rahal, just because his dad works somewhere doesn't mean he's going to be there. Cole Custer for a while, if we remember, was at Junior Motorsports, not at Stuart Haas Racing. Granted, at that time, Stuart Haas didn't have an Xfinity Series team, but it was a full-fledged Junior Motorsports truck, a full-fledged Junior Motorsports Xfinity car. Yeah, more certainly, or less, he was certainly, in yeah. The, yeah, for sure, in the JRM phase. It wasn't, of course, until now they went with it but i would like to see if cinder gets ends up somewhere else other than pesca to see how he does with a different team because we know ty is meant it could be another ty dylan situation where he could be at a team but maybe doesn't want to necessarily be known as just one thing kind of like where ty doesn't want to be at rcr just because he's a relative he's family he wants to do his own thing with jermaine albeit i think there's some alliance with it but it's a different team nonetheless you know, I've often been a proponent of... It's not that of, different anymore. They're, they're at the same campus now. Yeah, well, I mean, eventually eventually you come back home. But even like, you know, Louise, you'll probably appreciate this, but I've, I've often thought that if uh, that Marco Andretti would have left, left his daddy's team about three, four years ago and, and driven for somebody else, he might be in a different space than he is today. Uh, but, of course, the world will never know. But but I've often thought that uh, you know maybe he's been given the benefit of the doubt too much at Andretti Autosport, where maybe in another team he'd have been pushed a little more. Because because at the end of the day, uh, you know you know Marco showed some real real talent early on, and then somewhere around 2011 2012 he lost his way, and we've not seen that same spark. And and I I often wonder. You know, had he broke away from his dad and, and gone to drive for, you know, say, say an Ed Carpenter or a, a Dale Coyne, you know, or even a Bobby Rahal, uh, if his fortune would be different today? I don't imagine it would be somewhat different. And I and those were definitely the teams I was thinking, either Dale Coyne or Rahal. It would have been a different, a unique uh, dynamic, but also maybe would have grown a little bit more as a competitor. Because remember, remember even – with Michael, albeit different circumstances, he didn't stay with his dad's team. He went to Formula One and then he went to Ganassi before he went back and obviously ultimately ended up with. Well, Green I mean, Allen. even 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 prior to joining Newman Haas, he was with uh, the Craco team. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, before he was, uh, you know, put as a teammate to his dad. Uh, yeah. Then of course, then of course, eventually Michael went home, and, and then then eventually he left there to go to Team Green. Yes. You know, and and which he ended up buying Team Green, which is Andretti Autosport now. So I, I don't think that uh, you know, you know, back to the original conversation, which revolves around Austin Cindric. You know, I think the world is his oyster right now, and he really is putting on some really good performances. And and I don't believe that he needs to limit himself to a Penske or a Penske affiliated team. Yeah. And a guy like him, I don't think he should. He should explore different things, see how it pans out. It doesn't. It would be nice to see a guy like him break the mold. Maybe he change that bad. The off, often reasonable, but also often bad stereotype that they're only there for X, Y, and Z reasons. Dale mm. Jr. is another one as well. He left DEI, the, the fodder team, to go to Hendrick and start his own identity, brand new, fresh air. And I think for Cindric. It won't be a bad thing if that happens. Yeah, but we're putting a lot of carts before the horse right now because mm-hmm. he's uh, yeah, still but... still embroiled in a nice points battle in, in, in Xfinity. So uh, 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 somebody was trying to make a comment. Was that you, Richard, or Seth? Uh, that was me. Okay, uh, go ahead. Chime uh, in, and then, and then let's talk about uh, Harvick and the broom he has. I was going to say there's two more notes on Xfinity that I do want to bring up. Uh, Brandon Brown also had a rough weekend. Uh, He finished 12th, which honestly didn't look like it was going to happen at the start of the race. Uh, He started one lap down after losing fuel pressure during the pace laps. And this was the first race that his father and team owner, 
Jerry Brown, who also spots for him, was not at the track because he's battling uh, cancer as well. So uh, thoughts are with him. And Josh Williams and DGM Racing won their appeal, the, their penalty for testing at Daytona, the road course, has been rescinded. So they get back to 75 points and do not have to pay $50,000 because although they technically were testing, it was in a public race that the SCCA was promoting. Nice loophole. That that saved those guys a ton of money. Yeah, and now they're back in this ideal situation where a couple more strong runs by LeBay could tighten up that battle between Brown and Myatt Snyder, but we'll see how that goes well, for him. Then also, it should be interesting to see if the seven laps that they were able to complete before their test was essentially shut down, uh, or raced, rather, at the Daytona Road Course, if that seven laps of experience might come in handy for LeBay or not. Time will ultimately tell it. A bit. You'll find out next sure. weekend, right? Yeah, so... But let, let, let's talk about the uh, two cup races at Michigan. Um, both had the same result, but, uh, uh, you know, behind first place, we had a couple of different scenarios there. So, uh, Seth, you want to take us through it? And Louise, Louise and Rich, you guys jump in. Well, Kevin Harvick uh, dominated the weekend. There's no other way of saying it. In between the two races, he led 182 laps out of a possible uh 300 uh, or so laps. So he he basically flat out dominated. There's nothing else I could say about that. About 317 laps. Like the only other same thing was Truex finishing third in both of those races as well, which is now his fourth straight third place effort in as many races too. Which, granted, that's good for him. Uh, we had some good runs in the first race. Bubba Wallace running ninth. Uh, we had Christopher Bell finishing 13th, uh, although the choose rule uh, definitely played a role in both races, especially oh, the first did. one, especially the first one with Chase Elliott getting out there, getting into the lead, uh, whether or not he would have been able to hold off Harvick had that last caution not come out, who knows, uh, but he definitely was giving Harvick a run for his money. Uh, after choosing to restart on the inside, leading the inside lane and getting pushed out front. In the second race, the choose rule didn't as, have as much of an effect. Um, I would say maybe it did with uh, uh, Almirola when he accidentally stayed out because uh, his definition of a hot dog and his crew chief's definition of a hot dog are apparently two different things uh, in code words. But, um, yeah, it, it was an interesting race, to say the least. Well, sir, yeah, definitely it was an interesting concept. It was a lot of stuff going gone down. Now, the question is, Kyle Busch, of course, he had a good show in the first race. The second one, I felt like he had, he was more or less an afterthought, whereas there was a, which is, Kind of getting more concerning that we should be starting thinking about Kyle Busch probably going windless at this point. Uh, I'll be honest. I think even he is thinking that as well because um, and Kyle I think Busch he's won every single race since 2005, at least once since 05. At least one race a year, yes. Uh, Kyle Busch uh, actually joined us uh, in uh, – the Monday Night Racing League earlier this week. Uh, he uh, won that race, and in the post-race interview, he said that's probably the only place he'll get wins and get championship this year. That And that it would make him the ultimate king of the minors. So um, there's that. So if he's even joking about it, I, it's across his mind at least. Uh, so, but I will also say this with how many people in the second race went to backup cars, that definitely played a factor as to who was going to run strong and who wasn't going to run strong. I mean, Eric Almirola was 
a non-factor in the first race. In the second one, he got up to the lead, albeit by accident. Uh, but he ran well enough to get top 10, which he, I think, finished outside the top 15. Yeah, he finished 16th in the first race. Which ended that top 10 streak, I think, if I yeah. recall. So it was a, a tremendous turnaround for Whereas boy, you started pretty well, but then when Blaney Kostlowski wrecked, that ultimately hurt his afternoon. When he got run into by Bowman, who had no mm-hmm. to go. Yep. And real quick before we move on to Indy 500 practice, uh, I do want to also say there was a truck race this week, and Zane Smith earned his first career win uh, after leading only the final lap uh, due to some overtime shenanigans between Austin Hill and a few others. Uh, David Gravel in his Truck Series debut uh, got a top 10 finish, and Parker Klingerman with the never-ending tire rub somehow finished ninth. And Derek Krause finished backwards at the start finish line. Yeah, in eighth. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And that's a cold trickle move right there. So, anyway, so uh, we are on to Daytona uh, Road Course next weekend, correct? Yes. Yep. And that's uh, is that a Saturday night? No, it's a Sunday afternoon race. Su- Sunday afternoon race. Oh, that'll be hot. Um, so, who do you guys like for that? I wanna, I wanna go ahead and, and stick my neck out and say I like Ryan Blaney for this one. I'm gonna go with somebody who at least has experience on the Daytona Road Course uh, and recent experience at that. So, I'm gonna go with Kyle Busch. I'm gonna go with the Roadmaster Mark Truex Jr. All right, and uh, Richard, that leaves you. Kizowski. All right, there you go. Now, that'll be an interesting race because we've, uh, again, we're doing no no practice, no qualifying, uh, you know, unless you try to cheat in the SCCA race. <laughs> so, uh, but that, but that, but that'd be a fun one to, to have. The Cup cars ever driven the Daytona Road Course, or is it, is this a absolute first? There were some cup cars in the Rolex 24 in the 70s. Outside of that, this is the first. Yep, and after that, it won't go all the way because they're running the road course for the Bush Clash next year. Whoever gets invited, that's the big mystery since there's no more on merit qualifying well, since Kurt Busch in 600. Well, they are doing some sort of system of qualifying, which fastest lap from the previous race applies, so there's some... Until uh, we get clarification as to whether or not those will apply to the Bush Clash, it's probably whoever got a poll in 2019. At least that's my guess. I mean, yeah, like I said, we, we've got we've got to get through this shitty year before we start thinking about next yeah. year. So, uh, and speaking of this shitty year, <laughs> there it is. I cursed twice on radio. Um, yeah. 8500. Oh, op- oh, the 8500 uh, opened for practice uh, today. Um, Parnelli Jones, uh, waved the green flag for practice, uh, not at the flag stand, uh, virtually sitting by himself, uh, so he could take his mask off. Uh, but Parnelli also celebrating a birthday today, the oldest living, uh, winner of the 500, uh, turn 87 today, which will be a few days, um, back, uh, once the show airs. But, um, it's, we had 33 cars on track, um, the morning session was for the veterans. Uh, Scott Dixon was fastest in the morning session. Uh, the middle of the day session was for the rookies slash refreshers. Uh, so you had the, the five rookies there. Uh, four of those five rookies passed their uh, rookie orientation uh, test. Uh, and the one guy that didn't was Dalton Kellett. Uh, Kellett had to finish this up in the in the uh, in the afternoon session, and then the refreshers, of course, are the guys who are not full time in the series. And then the, the, there you saw Elio, Alonzo, Jerry, Hildebrand, uh, Sage Karam. Um, pretty good day. I mean, the speeds were at the end of the day. Then in the afternoon session, everybody was welcome, save for uh, Ben Hanley um, and the Dragon Speed team, who did not have their car quite put together uh, to make the um, earlier session they actually granted those guys an extra half hour at the end of the day to get a couple installation laps in and and get his refresher laps in uh but uh you know no uh nobody crashed today 
Um, the speeds were the top speed was uh, Hinchcliffe come out with the top speed of the day, um, 224 and change, which is about five mile per hour off of last year uh, day one practice. Day one practice, I think willpower top of charge 229, um, but but the um, the overall feeling from the drivers is that the uh, the air screen feels pretty good. Uh, they're getting used to it. Um, now, Louise, you've uh, you've read a lot of comments and a lot of uh, press releases, so uh, let me get some of your thoughts from the first day of practice, where we saw um, all Hondas at the top, fastest Chevrolet yep, yep. being fast Chevrolet being uh, oh that that guy from Spain, Fernando Alonso. Yeah, but it was definitely a Honda field day, notably the Andretti camp. We, you mentioned Hinchcliffe, Marco Andretti was second quickest, and Ryan Hunter Ray being fourth. The one in between Marco and Hunter Ray was Scott Dixon who's looking for a second Indy 500 win. He hasn't had one in 12 years. But it was definitely a Honda performance. And as far as the things that I took notice and the bit that I saw at the very end is the Arrow McLarens of not Alonso, who had a really good showing. So it shows that they might come out to play. But knowing how Indy works, things could change where you may start off pretty good, but at the end of the time at Indy, it will be a completely different story when it comes to pace or overall downright luck. But for Pato Award and Oliver Askew, they were down the charts. They were at the bottom. But it looks like, based on what I read, they were content with what they did on Wednesday. So it told me that they're just going to build over time. They're just getting the gist of it, running a higher competitor car, especially for Askew, last year's Freedom 100 winner, going much faster than what he's used to. So I would not be worried about Aaron McLaren the two full-time drivers being that low for now. And right, and, like, and, and both those guys are rookies because uh, Award was bumped out of the field last year. Yeah, so, so, so this, this is the first, first, although Award did do all, all the practice and all the qualifying leading up to it, he's still a rookie for the race. Uh, so, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's a, it's too early to pull a panic button on Aaron McLaren, particularly given Fernando Pace. Yeah, it's very, it's too early to tell. I think... Time will tell with Marco, because we talked about this off the year briefly, we mentioned it, how he starts good, but over time he regresses pretty badly. Like last year, he had a very aggressive, a miserable 500. He was not factor at all. And Marco pretty much said in the pressers that he's more concentrating on the race ahead, putting himself with different challenges and techniques to assure he has his best showing in a real long time. Because this is his 15th Indy 500, and he's still trying to get that elusive one maybe replicate, maybe one-up himself from his rookie race in 06. And imagine that story, Marco winning it. It's going to be a long shot for sure, but everything needs to fall into place. It'll be, that's the one guy I'd be curious to see how he does going forward, especially with the two next few days of practice. Qualifying is qualifying. You never know what's going to happen. But if he's focusing on race trim, then we'll see how the end product comes out next week. Certainly, and the Penske cars are kind of, they're not at the bottom, they're not at the top, they're kind of in the middle, but but we've seen, uh, you know, Penske has been accused of sandbagging. I don't know if they ever really sandbag, but but when, uh, you know, when it comes down to Fast Friday and whatnot, it wouldn't surprise me to see, you know, Will and Elio, uh, Simon and Joseph right up there in the mix. Uh, but but again, Dixon looked really strong today, and to your point, Dixon is way overdue for a second. Indi- I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable that the guy with all all the wins and all the championships, he's got the one Indy 500 to his name, right? And he's he's won the pole at Indy what, four times. Is that correct? Right after Ed Harper with the most poles among active drivers. Yeah, I want to sure. say he's got he's got four. Ed's got three. Um, so, and the carpenter cars weren't bad either today, you know, the Space Force. No, VK had a pretty good showing, but then... VK had a really good day, yeah. Yeah, he did quite well. Alex Pelot, once again, cracking it at the top ten, he's really adapting to those ovals extraordinarily well. He outbeat Santino in the opening section. I was curious how he did. James Davison also had a pretty quiet, possible day, especially with the... People give Rick Ware the bad the bad stigma because it is a Rick Ware car. But again, for those NASCAR folks, yes, it says Rick Ware, but is it the old coin car? So he should be fine. Davis has run the 500 multiple times. He was right up there in 17 as well. Yeah, certainly. So uh, again, you know, by the time the show airs, there'll be two more days of practice in. 
Uh, so uh, things could definitely change, but uh, pretty good first day uh, of the Speedway being open for the 500 cars. Uh, again, you know, no major incidents. Nobody cracked the wall. Nobody got hurt. Um, Don Kellett squeaked out his, uh, I mean, Kellett already dodged a bullet with, uh, 33 cars in the field <laughs> because if somebody, yeah. if somebody was going to be bumped, that'd be the guy. Uh, that so he, uh, water one. You yeah, that yeah. guys like Hukos and RC Anderson. Those guys were not, are not in this 500 or 400 or Peppa man, or even Stephen Wilson. I don't know how he fit in, but imagine those four teams and drivers Kellett would be in trouble for sure oh yeah he'd be in trouble yeah so but uh, yeah but Kellett again he squeaked it out he had to he had to let uh Tony Kanon hop in his car for a little bit uh just to make sure it was okay for for advice on the setup you know Tony hopped in his car drove it for a couple laps uh went pretty much, <laughs> quite a bit faster than Kellett brought the car back said your car's fine buddy get out there and do it uh, and and, yeah, I mean, and, and to Kellett's credit, he did. He, he passed the ROP, so uh, good for him. But uh, we are out of time. So, Louise, thank you so much. Seth, Richard, thank you guys. I want to thank the Hubazoo Radio Network. I want to thank Spreaker, iHeartRadio, and Google Podcasts. And I want to thank all you folks who listen to us. We'll be back in a week. Until then, good night. <laughs> W-H-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-N-A-C-O-O-N-A-C-O-O-N-A-C-O-O-N-A-C-O-O-N-A-C-O-O-N-A-C-O-O-N-A-C-O-O-N-A-C-O-O-N